Okay then. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Khwaja Sheriyar Nasir and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the 20th uh, Shokat Khanam Symposium. Uh, this is going to be a session on publishing a manuscript. Uh, I have had pleasure of hosting this session uh, twice now. Uh, and coincidentally, since last year, uh, we have been conducting this uh, particular symposium online because of the ongoing uh, pandemic. So uh, I'm extremely excited uh, because I have three very nice uh, panelists for you, and I'm looking forward to discussing uh, with them on different aspects of publishing a manuscript. Uh, I would like to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Emma Sultan. Uh, Dr. Sultan did his, he has two uh, specializations. He did oral medicine and he has a PhD in oral pathology. Uh, currently, Dr. Sultan is working as a uh, clinical assistant professor in University of Maryland uh, School of Dentistry in USA. Uh, we have Dr. Maryam Jisri. Uh, Dr. Maryam has been involved in uh, various topics related to research, but uh, her specialization is in oral medicine. Uh, Dr. Jisri graduated from uh, Harvard University School of Dental Medicine and Brigham and Women Hospital and then moved to Australia, where initially she was involved with University of Western Australia, but currently uh, she has moved and recently this year uh, joined uh, Queensland Health and she's working there as a consultant specialist. And we also have Dr. Samir Riaz Kazi. Uh, Dr. Samir uh, is an old surgeon. Um, he is a fellow faculty, Royal College of Dental Surgeons in Ireland. And he has also master's in philosophy, degree in education. Dr. Samir has been involved in teaching and research. Uh, he's an old surgeon by practice for a good chunk of his career, however, recently what I assume is a sabbatical, uh, he has now moved to uh, practicing uh, privately. Uh, so I think there might be some issue going on. Uh, we can't see our panelists. So I'm going to ask our uh, media team uh, to make sure that our panelists are visible to the audience. Uh, if I can request my session three co-hosts to please do that for us. Uh, meanwhile, they try to solve this in back end. Uh, I'm gonna move forward uh, with certain housekeeping rules. So we are going to be doing poll questions. Each question will be displayed for 30 seconds. Uh, participants can choose a suitable response for the given option. They'll have about 30 seconds. Most of these questions are going to have at least uh, one choice or sometimes they'll have more than one. Uh, and then we'll go on to a panel-based discussion. Uh, on the other hand, once we are done, there are about nine questions. Uh, then we'll have questions from the participants. Uh, please use the question and answer feature to ask any questions that you may have from the panelists. Um, I don't know what's going on. I'm so sorry for this inconvenience. Uh, so let me just uh, quickly take a pause, if you don't mind, and see if I can ask them to help me out with this. Uh, please hang on. I'm so sorry for this. We'll be right back. So, uh, yep, so I'm so sorry uh, for this delay. Uh, welcome, Dr. Samir, Dr. Emma Sultan, and Dr. Mariam. Uh, I'm so sorry for this glitch, uh, but I'm glad that I sorted it out. So, uh, I, I think everyone heard what I said uh, while I was giving the uh, introductions, uh, or would you like me to go back? Perfect. So, I'll ask our media team to launch the first poll. Oh, so here we go. So while uh, 
people answer this question for us, I'm going to actually start off by asking Dr. Sultan, who I might every now and then refer to as Buddy, because we were both co-residents and that's how we used to address each other. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, do you mind explaining to our audience that uh, what are the different steps that a manuscript goes through when uh, a person submits it to a journal? Sure, and uh, thanks for uh, having me here today. Uh, so the initial stage is the planning stage, of course, where um, you're going to brainstorm uh, the topic and the study design. And um, a lot of you may be aware of the hierarchy of evidence tree where it kind of outlines at the very top, you have systematic review meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. And then at the very bottom, you've got animal studies, case reports, case series. So once you decide on um, the study type and the topic, whether it's original research, um, that is you're doing clinical studies or basic science experiments versus non-original research like a literature review or case reports or, or, or descriptive studies. Then you uh, move on into preparing your manuscript um, and then uh, ultimately um, you progress to the submission stage. Uh, nowadays, the manuscript submission is relatively um, easy because it's uh, electronic. Um, in, and, you know, in the olden days, everything was in paper and mailed out, but now it's relatively easy. And whichever uh, journal destination you decide, the author guidelines are available to you, uh, which you could, we should closely conform to. Um, if you don't format your paper according to the author guidelines, you will notice that after you submit your manuscript, uh, you may have uh, delays. The editorial team might reach out to you and ask you to reformat your references correctly or the word count correctly. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind uh, before you submit that you uh, pay close attention to the author instruction guidelines. Perfect. Thank you so much. So uh, just to give a hit, you know, summarize our poll results. So about 57% of our participants right now uh, have either not published anything or have published between one to three papers, uh, which sort of takes me now to the question which I asked Dr. Samir about 15 years ago, which was that, why should I publish? Like, what's the reason behind it? Like, why should I or someone, uh, you know, in the healthcare industry should publish? What's the reason behind it? Uh, Shaya, thank you so much for inviting me. And um, I suppose, you know, the correct answer should be that you need, you should publish because there's something that you want to share. There's some research that you're doing that, you know, you're really passionate about and you want to share it with the rest of the world. Unfortunately, the reality is that most of us end up publishing because it's a requirement for, you know, further promotions and to get better jobs and stuff. So, um, I, yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a spectrum of reasons, I suppose. And um, maybe I can just say that, uh, you know, such good things have happened to people who publish, you know, because a lot of students come up and we have this discussion. And over the years, you know, there are so many examples of students who did some small research, who published this in an unknown journal, but that really helped them so much later on in their careers. So uh, publishing, you know, is one of those essential things that in healthcare, if you then you, you should just do it. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, it, it does, it does. And it's very interesting your take on it because you, you started off by saying that we usually want to do it if you want to share it with others. But that was the least popular answer in our poll today. Uh, and the majority of the audience felt that it was most related to improving your resume, change, change in practice, or highlight an issue, uh, but less likely to for educating others, which is fine. Uh, Dr. Mariam, I'll come to you now. Uh, you have been involved in doing a lot of research. You have more than 50 papers to your name. Uh, why do you publish? What motivates you? 
Well, that's a question. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, it changes. So through our time and throughout your career, you change why you want to publish. Um, as Dr. Kasi said, um, at some point in your career, when you're very early on, you're publishing to improve your resume. So others will give you the chance to go and work with them, work for them and learn from them. And as you grow and as you um, build your career and as you develop a reputation for yourself, then you, you come up with ideas. And those ideas are, um, they, when you first come up with an idea, it sounds so brilliant in your own mind that you think that this is the best thing anybody has ever come up with. And that is a very dangerous place and position to be. And one of the best things about publishing is that it's like a child that you send it out to the world and you receive parent reports, your teacher reports from others who work in your field. And they will tell you, look, I liked your work and I cited you. And that is always quiet and that improves your career. Or those who really, really, really dislike what you've done and they find it in their heart and the time <laughs> to write a letter to editor and say, I really dislike what she did and that is why I'm writing to you. So during the time that your career develops and improves and progresses, the reasoning changes. For me right now, the reason that I still continue to publish, although I'm a clinician at this stage in time, is because I have found that niche in oral medicine that I want to answer my patients. So I do research to find answers for patients, real patients who sit in front of me and question me what to do about this particular problem. So if you look at my previous research, it was very abstract. It was all about this weird gene that only um, expresses in a small population of patients. But now my research is about real life problems that answers real life questions. And if I'm worthy of it, if I find the answer, I would like to share it with others to get their feedback. And also if it helps anybody, if I'm going to be arrogant enough to say, if I'm helping anybody or educating somebody, you know, that's a worthy cause. Hopefully I've answered your question. I went around Blocked a few times. No, no. Uh, fair enough. Uh, Can I and say something? Uh, sure. Doctor, such a pleasure to hear your views. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that I was one of those clinicians who was thrown into this and I had to struggle through my research. But at this stage in life, I don't need to do any research. But, you know, something that I feel really passionate about, you know, uh, I want to publish and I want to do it. So, so it's a self motivated thing. Another very interesting aspect, the reason I, I still do research is data analysis, because over the years I've learned to really enjoy it. It's, it's the most fun thing, you know, statistical analysis. And I've sort of over the years tried to make myself independent in it. So that gives me so much pleasure, uh, you know, to look at data and to generate results. So that's one of the great motivations for me. And, and that's really interesting. Um... And I would like to, though, talk about the other aspect of publishing. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, I'm going to put you on spotlight now. Uh, you and I were having a discussion a couple of days ago with our colleague, Dr. Bavarian, where we spoke about uh, the job description and how sometimes research plays into that. Do you mind sharing your views with the rest of the audience on Sure. Um, so I think that as your um, career progresses and as your, you know, your job title and job position changes, the type of research you do will change. So, for example, if you're hired in an academic institution, there are different um, tracks. So there's a clinical tract. Uh, where you're mainly a clinician, and you can do clinical research there. There's a research um, assistant professor tract where you're more heavily uh, research focused, and maybe you don't have clinical training. And then there is the assistant professor tenure tract. Now, 
uh, there are certain metrics that uh, APT committees, so the appointment promotion tenure committees, look at um, uh, when they review your application for promotion. If you are in the assistant professor tenure track or the research track, what they're looking for is um, research papers you have done in the original research field. Um, and, you know, original research takes quite some time to publish. You could work on a paper for a year or two, um, and then it gets into, you know, slightly higher impact journals. And when I mean original research, I mean things that are conducted as uh, in vitro or ex vivo or in vivo experiments on animals or in the laboratory um, or on patient samples. However, if you're on a clinical tract, what tends to happen is they factor a lot your clinical services to the institution or to the community. And therefore, you see a lot of clinical uh, uh, researchers or professors publishing a lot of case reports and case series. Um, and, you know, there's value in publishing uh, case reports and case series. Um, I know that you know, especially if a lot of you work at um, tertiary referral centers or academic institutions, uh, you'll get referred things that general uh, practitioners may or may not be comfortable in treating. And I've had patients come up and say, well, I saw your publication on this. It's a very rare condition. Um, and that's why I decided to come to you. So Again, one of the um, important considerations for why to publish and specifically what type of research to publish may be dictated by your career pathway. So thank you. Uh, so I'm going to back to Mariam. Uh, you mentioned something about sharing the research or the best question that you can think of. So how do you develop that research question? That was a perfect um, gateway, by the way, to my, you know, my next poll, though, by the way, <laughs> just coincidentally happened that way. Okay. Um, I, I think nobody has answered this question better than an old man called Anthony, who was a lab uh, technician when I first started my PhD. And he said something very interesting. He said, knowledge is knowing the answer to questions, but wisdom is knowing what question needs to be left unanswered. So there are so many questions that you see in your clinical practice that don't have to be answered. Example, um, Ahmed and I recently, not very recently, but a few months ago had a, re had a discussion about somebody asking why uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid and lichen planus mostly involve the buccal aspect of the teeth instead of the lingual aspect of the teeth. It's one of those questions, it's interesting, you can go and spend your life trying to find the answer, but the answer is really not going to change anything. So for me, as a person who's coming from a hardcore basic science background and into a clinical world, for me, the question that is burning and needs to be answered is the question that is going to be changing um, the life of real people. So what is that question? And what is the easiest, not necessarily easiest, but what is the most cost-effective, beneficial way of getting to that answer? And am I the best person to answer that question? I could have so many questions about the very rare conditions that are out there, but I'm not going to see those patients. So I'm not the person to answer those questions. So in order to be able to publish, you need to first identify your resources, identify your questions, have a um, kind of Euler analysis, find what is common between the two with what resources that you have, you can answer the most efficiently, the, the most interesting question that you have. And once you have the common denominator between the two, then you will have a very successful research career. Because so many of us go into the lab, come up with weird ideas, try and get grants and can't get grants, get grants, don't have patients, don't have samples, don't have the expertise and just burn away our career. So the best question for me and the, how I do develop research questions is that I look around myself, 
I find expertise, I find resources, and I find questions. And what is common between the three of them is my research question. Nice. Uh, Dr. Samir? I'm just amazed to uh, listen to these two you know, <laughs> great people who, you know, it's, it's a different culture. Pakistan is, is such a different place. And we don't have, you know, grants. Uh, we don't get grants, research grants. There are no different tracks or career paths that you can take. There's no mentors that you can look up to who, who know, you know, enough about this. Uh, so um, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just amazed and I don't know, I, I just want to throw it back to, you know, Dr. Ahmed Mithi, because I have no idea. <laughs> Ahmed? Yeah, well, what, what, what I would say is that one of the criteria that a lot of, um, you know, reputable journals, um, and even when you're submitting a research grant, the very first thing the editor will ask a external reviewer or a reviewer of a manuscript is to select on a scale of one to five or one to a hundred what the impact or significance of that publication is in terms of its clinical relevance, in terms of its impact in benefiting, benefiting patients and the impact of the readership of the journal. So when you're developing a research question, um, there are different broad categories. There is the category of um, pathophysiology, ethopathogenesis, mechanistic. So understanding at a very basic level, why, um, what causes a disease, okay? And a lot of these studies can come from basic research, from animal studies. What is the mechanism that gives rise to something? And then the other broad category is translational research, clinical research um, that would benefit the patient either by changing how we diagnose things or how we manage things. So the very first thing I urge you to do when you're going to devote a large amount of your time to a research project is to brainstorm with your colleagues about what research would benefit patients and the field in terms of its significance and impact. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Which, and I'll go to my next poll question now. Uh, so a lot of times what I feel everyone struggles with is that how do we shortlist the right journal, which I think is the essential part of publishing. Uh, Ahmed, what do you think about it? Like, how do you go by when you want to choose what journal should your uh, manuscript go to? Well, I'm glad you asked me this question because uh, recently I've been intrigued with um, journal selection just because in the last couple of years there's been a tremendous rise in predatory journals. And Predator do you mind? Yes. Do you mind? Sorry, I'm just sorry about cutting in. Do you mind explaining to our audience what are these predatory journals? Yeah. Sure. So the definition of a predatory journal um, and the word in it is predator, right? It's a journal where they charge you large sums of money. So they're called open access journals. And that's their only format for you to submit the paper and get it accepted. So they charge you large sums of money, but then on the other side, do, they do not deliver in their um, editorial and reviewing peer review responsibilities. So uh, it's, it's almost called pay to publish. The issue with that is that you have submitted your paper that you've worked very hard on. And then you realize after a few years, the journal doesn't have any citations. And so the awareness of your paper doesn't reach the readership. It doesn't reach people. It doesn't impact people or other researchers. And you've spent uh, you know, a ton of money on. And usually these journals are very easy to get accepted into. So that's a red flag. One of the um, signs that it's a reputable journal is high rejection rates. If you're submitting to a journal that's rejecting you, that's because they have a panel of editors that are really looking at the, the rigor and quality of your research. Um, but also it's looking at their editorial board, looking at their uh, review panels to see if they are experts in your field. Oftentimes with these predatory journals, you have people that review your paper 
um, that have nothing to do or no expertise in your field. And there's a very rapid turnaround for your paper, even one or two weeks. Uh, a lot of the reputable journal, your paper might sit there for um, a couple of months. Um, so that's just to give you a kind of a sense of um, what a predatory journal is. And there's a huge rise in this. And a lot of you probably get a lot of these invitations from unknown journals, um, from unknown editors when you try and look them up. A lot of it goes to junk mail, spam mail, but you still can get it in your regular inbox. So what I would say is, if you're getting a lot of invites um, and there's suspiciously high impact factors, journals you haven't heard before, you look up their editorial board, the editorial board don't have a track record, the journal doesn't have citations, there's a high um, cost fee associated with it. Uh, I would caution that. There are websites and sources out there um, that list predatory journals. Um, and there is some resources out there where, um, you know, it, it kind of gives you which journals are reputable or not. Uh, perfect. Uh, Mariam, do you want to add anything to it? Um, oh, not really, except, <laughs> except um, when you're deciding where to publish, decide whom you want to read your article. So if you have, I don't know, if let's say uh, you are a pathologist, but you have written something or found something, let's say it's a case report, as easy as a case report. Um, but your case report is important for a surgeon in order to how to deal with a particular thing. Instead of going down the path of publishing in your own field, go and publish where surgeons are going to read this paper. Because first of all, you want citation and people who have read your paper are going to cite it. And also you want to change something potentially if you are very, you know, um, uh, high-minded and you are past that point of citation, you want to change something. And if you publish something that is relevant to surgeons in a journal that is read by prosthodontists, it's not going to be useful or helpful at all. And it's not going to change anything. So know your audience. That's um, my way of um, finding journals. I, whom I want to read this paper. And that's, I agree with that. I think that's very important because a lot of times what we do is that we forget about the reader aspect of things and we always are so much focused in getting our stuff published. We don't think about the fact that someone at the end of the day or what's the end goal of that. Uh, and I'm going to go back to Emma's statement there. So sometimes editors would read your manuscript and they would immediately reject it. But deep down or you might actually think that that's very unfair uh, because in your mind, in your head, your vision, uh, I, you feel that that particular paper deserves a place in that particular journal because of the readership of that journal, because of the audience that, refer, that journal goes to or the society that it might link to. And which takes me to my, actually, uh, and the, to my next poll question, uh, which is about a sort of a, I don't know why it has become more of a controversial thing now, which is cover letters. Uh, for our audience, cover letters are usually, and that's what actually the poll is. Uh, it should load up any second now. Uh, so the cover letter is about, uh, th there's two different polls now to it. Uh, one group thinks that it is a very essential part of your submission where you can actually talk to the editor directly and you can fight for your cause in your case. Whereas the other part actually thinks that this is a totally useless document that is just arbitrary. And it has been going on for since the inception of uh, introduction and uh, doesn't stand a place in the electronic format that is taken over now. So what's your take on it? Emma? Yes, yeah. yeah, so the, um, it's interesting because early, uh, early in my career when I was publishing, I never wrote cover letters or uh, if they were required, they'd be very brief. Please find attached my sub submitted manuscript. All authors agree and all the statements that you have to put in. But 
um, later on, I realized that it gives you a hidden, unique opportunity to um, converse with the editor in the sense that you can let them know um, significant aspects of your manuscript that you think are unique to their journal and warrant publication. Um, and so you could have spent a lot of time writing the manuscript and you sent it into the journal and then you get an immediate rejection had you not written a cover letter because the editor would only have your abstract to kind of verify and they may skim through your manuscript, but you know, um, with limited time they have, they probably refer to your abstract. So think of it as a cover letter as building additional reasons for why they should consider your paper um, aside from the abstract. So writing a strong cover letter and it can be one page, it can be concise, but strong. Sometimes what I like to put in the cover letter is uh, why this manuscript is unique in the sense that um, it's slightly different from what's available because X, Y, and Z, or I like to highlight the authorship team. If you have a multidisciplinary team, editors might like to know who your team of authors are, what they're contributing. Um, and then the, the final statement I like to put in it is why it would benefit the specific readership of that journal. Uh, and then these are kind of hidden messages that you can get across to the editor um, to help them in their judgment, whether they are going to assign the paper to the to reviewers will go out for review versus a quick rejection. Great. So um, on the authorship part, uh, which brings me to the, my next question uh, about the authorship status of papers. And Dr. Simon, I'm going to put, ask you this now. So now recently, this thing has come up of uh, having ghost authors, where if you're, which I feel is quite, uh, which is, I think, prevalent all across the globe, not even in Pakistan. I know, I feel, I always felt it was more so in Pakistan, that if your department head is not on the paper, then you might actually get uh, in trouble or you need to put in the name of your professor uh, who might have not even read the paper once or have no idea about the paper or what's your take on it? Like, should we put those uh, professors and at the end of the day, you know, they say that because of them, we got the grant or because of them, we were given the opportunity to do the research, but do we actually keep that or should we keep only those people who have actually intellectually participated in this process? It's quite a loaded question. Now the answer is very straightforward. We should just keep the people who significantly contributed the, the regulations or the, or the guidelines are very clear. They, they're published on the web so you can you know, see exactly what they are. Um, I know that this is a problem not only in Pakistan, this is a rampant problem, but I've worked in Ireland and unfortunately I've also, the same thing was going on there to a lesser extent, unfortunately. So uh, this is ramp, it's all over the world. It's some, you know, and the problem is the pressure that, 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 you know, your seniors or your mentors can create on you and your job is sometime online, your whole career is sometimes on the line. So I don't blame people a lot who sort of, that, you know, because it's, it's very difficult, you know, and this is the thing that um, if you're not going to be ethical in your research, um, I don't know, the search doesn't really hold very much value for me. So uh, for me, there is no, there's, there's, there's no dilemma at all as far as this is concerned. But when somebody does it, I, I sometimes, you know, life is tough. So sometimes, you know, situations are tough. So, so for someone who's, who's been a professor in Pakistan, uh, so how would you then guide a young researcher how should they take? Should they just accept it and just add them in? Or do you I like always give them the option? You know, I've had situations where, where, where a student was sitting with me and we had his paper and we were discussing where to publish it. And another faculty member walked in and said, if you give it to me and, you know, I can add my name to it and I'll publish it in XYZ journal, no questions asked and everything. And, and this student was so tempted. And I didn't, I just, you know, told the student that you've got to think about it and you make the decision and 
whatever. And, you know, she made the right decision and, and didn't do it. And she, it, it took another six, eight months to finally get that thing published. But we both felt so good about it. So I don't know. I, I, I know this is rampant and you've got to make your own decisions in this. Um, uh, I know you want to get other people's views on this, but maybe can I add a couple of words about uh, the couple of questions before this? Yeah, please, please do, please do. Please. Uh, about shortlisting the journals, I noticed that in your poll, very few people selected that option where you look at the references of your own article. And I yes. think it's a place to start because those journals are the ones that are publishing this type of research. So look at you know the for your main references that you have. And um, so that's a great place to start off. And you know, because of the impact factors, they would be interested in publishing because you'd be citing them and so forth. So there's a chance of getting published in those journals. And once you have a list, then I would say that you know, don't be afraid of targeting the, the best, the most highest impact factor or the best journal that you have amongst those. Because even when they reject you, they really communicate with you. You know, good editors writing a, 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 a proper, you know, a cover letter, communicating with them, they give you so much feedback, even when they reject you. That really helps you to improve your article. So um, I just wanted to say that about the last couple. No, I, no, I'm so glad that you pointed that out. I'm so sorry that I skipped that because I was trying to make sure that we don't run late. Uh, so this this particular example that you gave, I think I think that's the reason why I've been doing that for the last fifteen years now because I think you planted that seed in my head uh, long ago of doing this exact same routine, and I know I always try uh, to do that because if you believe in what you have done is of a good quality, uh, then there's if unless uh, so I don't feel that what I'm trying to say is that if you don't believe in what you have done, I don't think any other person. Uh, or other co colleague would actually agree with that. So always try to go with the best paper, with the best journal that's available for that particular topic. And you should always try that. Uh, so going back to uh, our, this particular question, uh, Mariam, uh, what's your take on this? Have you been in certain situation where you had to add someone uh, or uh, how would you go by now about it? Oh God, yes. Uh, who hasn't? Um, and it's not a Pakistan problem. It's everywhere. I know places that um, if you want to do a PhD, the head of school should be your PhD supervisor, whether or not they have any expertise in your field or not. They, they will be your PhD supervisor and they will make the career, which is going towards retirement anyways, by you know, being added as ghost authors to students. Um, have I been in that situation? Yes. Um, what have I done? <laughs> well, I tried to do the right thing. As a result of that, I lost $105,000 in grants. Um, would I recommend that to everybody? Yes, you sleep better at night if you do it, but your career is going to get a hit from it. So um, it's, it's, it's a difference between different approaches, you know, um, different people have different priorities in life. For me, a clean cut paper that every single person has contributed um, according to the place that they have as an author. The last person is supposed to be the person who oversees everybody. And the first person is the person that needs to take all the load and do the, you know, be the soldier and do the groundwork. Uh, for me, having a paper like that is more important than having a paper. So if it is not clean, I don't want it. But somebody might be in a position that is desperate to publish and they have a little bit less, you know, restricted and restrict uh, moral compass. And they might go ahead and let somebody that hasn't done anything on that paper just to lend them. So this is very common in very good universities that the head of this department will allow that person to be on the paper of their student provided that they reciprocate the favor. And it is not, it is not a, it is not an unheard of thing. It is not an uncommon thing. It happens and puts the student in a very hard position when that happens. And most of the time the students or the person that is very junior doesn't have the power to say no, and it becomes very awkward and you become the bad person. 
But, you know, doing the right thing is not always easy. That's what I would say. Well said. Uh, Emmett, you are in a clinical assistant professor track position right now. Yes. Have you, um, have you been pushing your students uh, to include you in their manuscripts or... Uh, no, I think something that was said by Dr. Samir is very important is ethics in publishing. Um, and there's ethic, um, there's etiquettes online and there's journal articles written on ethics in publishing. Once you publish a paper, that becomes your academic record and it's there for life. So uh, I would be cautious in, um, you know, who you publish with um, that you're confident everyone on the manuscript maintains a high level of ethics. Now, it's obviously challenging when you're in a place of uh, where you have a superior. Uh, what I would say is that if you're in a place where there are many superiors, many professors, um, that you should be as patient as you can be in the sense that don't rush to publish. If you find a professor that has you know, high ethical uh, standards and is uh, being reasonable and fair with everyone in their contribution, putting the first authors who contributed the most and so forth, and you can be patient, um, I would collaborate with that professor. Sometimes uh, you don't have that option. If it's your dean or if it's your chairman or your direct superior, you don't have that option. But when you do gain independence, um, the best advice is be patient, publish ethically, um, because it would be on your um, permanent record, essentially. And then my final point is the poll that you did for question six is very interesting because 92% is the correct answer. But in the mm -hmm. real world, what actually happens is more so the 17%. That's yes. more towards the 92 than the other way around. So it is epidemic. It's a problem that happens in every institution. Uh, the more and more you become independent, you have control over who you publish with. And be patient. There's no Russian publishing. Um, it's better to have a strong, higher impact um, uh, manuscript on your academic record than a rushed manuscript with a lot of ghost authors. Agree. Uh, thank you. So now we're going to move uh, take it up a few gears now. So my next question is about the actual aspect of publishing. So whenever we do send our manuscript, what, so I'm going to ask our audience first, what do they think is the most common reason for rejection? Uh, I don't know if poll was visible for, uh, or just got closed. Uh, if I can ask our media. Yeah. So can we uh, repeat that poll, please, if that's possible? Uh, so here we go. So what do you think uh, is the most common reason for a paper to be getting re rejected? Uh, we'll start off with Mariam. You can go first. Um, well, I think I'm a bit biased um, because I don't know the uh, real statistics of it. but. My, yeah, just um, my personal experience as a reviewer um, is that most often than not, people don't know how to um, communicate with you. So it could be that there are a lot of papers that are incomplete and those incomplete, you know, bad formatting and all that will get sifted through at the beginning by the editorial. So it doesn't go out to review to begin with. But as a reviewer, I reject a lot of papers because I just don't understand what they were trying to do. They might have had a very good idea, but and it, it is not a language barrier. It is a matter of, Ahmed said something very interesting and very important. It seems that they were in a rush to write what they had done. You spent a year, a year and a half collecting data, doing statistical analysis and all of those things and try to write the paper overnight and you submit something that is rushed and incomplete and messy. And as a reviewer, I think I have rejected more papers because of the way it was written and I couldn't understand what was going on than anything else. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Salman? Um, 
uh, the poll results are very interesting because uh, I also review uh, articles for journals and yep. Pakistan, at least I know that the main reason is the third one, one of the main reasons, is the third one, which is the incomprehensible language of figures or bad use of language. But if that can be improved, but it's basically uh, incorrect methods or bad planning. They've just used the wrong methodology to study something. This is such a common problem. And um, so then you can't, you know, you can't even improve it or do it because it's sort of bad planning. So it's related to that, plus terrible writing of the article. You know. uh, so, so before I bring Ahmed on, I would like to share the most common reasons for a manuscript to be rejected. So across different journals, most of the journals say that the most common reason for rejecting a manuscript is incomplete application, which is sort of what Mariam sort of touched as well by going in uh, feeling rushed. You don't read what the journal guidelines are and they just submit it to the journal. So once I actually got, I'm an editor of a journal and I once got a uh, application in which the cover letter was written for some other journal. So obviously I knew that we were not the first choice, which is fine. But in general, that just shows that sometimes there is such a rush that we don't complete. And most of these papers actually get desk rejected. Uh, that's the term that gets thrown away most very commonly where what Emmett talked about earlier as well, that editor will read it and it will, he will or she might think that this paper doesn't even deserve to be sent to reviewers and they'll reject it right there and then. Uh, Emmett, do you have, uh, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, I think um, it's important to highlight the definition of rejection because some, you know, when you're early um, in your publishing career and you, you submit articles and you get an immediate rejection from the editor, um, you think that automatically you're, the science in your paper isn't good enough. Um, it may just be that you weren't the right uh, the scope of the journal, or you weren't the right venue, your, your research wasn't the right venue for that article uh, versus the science not being good. So what I actually define as rejection is if the editor sends it out to peer review and then you have three, two or three independent peer reviewers who then reject your article based on the merits of the science. So um, I just want the audience to not get caught up too much on a rejection if uh, it was been immediately rejected by the editor because maybe the editor didn't think it fit the scope of their journal. And that goes back to which articles, you know, in terms of journal selection. Um, and then if you look at the, res the, the options given here, the main reasons for rejection after it's gone out to peer review would probably be uh, inadequate methodology, or the science is weak. Uh, English language barriers and things like that, uh, reviewers are given a, a, a prompt before they review articles that the studies or the manuscript should be reviews on the merits of the science and that English language can be um, edited later on. Uh, one thing I would say to as a strategy to help people uh, who want to ensure their methodology is solid it is many of the uh, different types of study designs have checklists now. Some journals require them, some don't. For example, um, if you're gonna publish a systematic review meta-analysis, there's a Prisma checklist. Uh, and that's required to publish that type of study. But if you look at cohort studies, uh, there's the Strobe checklist. Not every journal asks you for that checklist. For case reports, there is a new checklist to use. And so what I would encourage you to do is use these checklists, even if the journals don't require them, because that will show you that you're following the uh, appropriate methodology, kind of in a comprehensive systematic approach, and your chances of getting that true to the editor to send it out for peer review would, would probably be higher because you're enhancing the level of the methodology there. Yeah, so for, that's a very interesting point. Uh, so for our audience, I will elaborate on it. So there are these guidelines called Equator Guidelines, E-Q-U-A-T-O-R, uh, which is a sort of a network of different uh, organizations that have pulled in different 
uh, guidelines such as strobe, core, uh, prisma, which actually would allow you to formulate and structureize your manuscript. Uh, so now I'll ask you guys to uh, actually wear your reviewer hats. And uh, Dr. Samir, I'll ask you this first. So when you talked about this briefly as well, so imagine when you are reviewing a manuscript, what's the most important thing that you are looking at in a manuscript? I suppose first it's the journal that I'm reviewing for. You know, the journal sort of is, it has to be relevant uh, to the journal and, uh, you know, should be publishable in it. And then I'm just going to look at your options. Oops. I think relevance, clinical relevance is key to it. You see um, that, is it going to be of any benefit to people and is it relevant? Then it's sometimes there are sort of niche areas which are not very important, but still need to be addressed. So that's not the sole criteria. Uh, with my experience of reviewing articles in Pakistan, it's the methods, you know, it's a methodology that is generally so weak. And so I'm generally looking at, you know, the methods, uh, the statistical analysis is terrible, you know, the, the data analysis. So the results are generally very weak. And most articles, I'm sorry, get rejected because of that. But so I'm looking for, you know, relevance to the journal and importance, I suppose, to, to the audience of the journey. So it's very interesting that uh, a lot of people think along those lines, but methodology of research was somewhat the weakest factor that everyone took into account. Uh, Mariam, what about you? Do you think uh, method, I always felt that methodology of a paper was the backbone of a study. Uh, once someone told me that if you can tell if a methodology is good by just reading the paper and being able to replicate the study methods by just reading the paper itself and you don't have to read anything else. Yes. Um, the way I read um, papers that are sent out to review is that I read the last paragraph of the introduction uh, because in the last paragraph of introduction, they tell you what the hypothesis is. I don't care about them writing, you know, this is why we do. No, just give me what your hypothesis is. And then I look at the methodology. If the methodology is in accordance with the hypothesis, then that paper has a chance. And I will go and start from the beginning and give it a chance and read it okay. over. Well, I'm glad that you said that. <laughs> That you're actually going to go and back and read the whole paper. For one yes. second, I was very, very afraid that what's with what's going on here now. No, no. <laughs> but if it's not, you know, you know that you're dealing with a very weak paper, and these people don't even know what they're doing. For me, the backbone of a paper is in the methodology. If you don't know um, that this method is not going to answer your hypotheses, you probably are going to be a person that you know is very hasn't picked correctly. Let's just be kind. It hasn't picked correctly. <laughs> but uh, yes, as you said, um, it's hard to replicate the data based on the paper, but you should have a feeling that if I put in the effort, you know, I don't want you to tell me how to do immunohistochemistry um, staining in the lab, but at least give me the little details that are necessary in order to be able to um, understand that you knew exactly what you were doing. So, um, yeah, for me, methodology is where I look at. Uh, Ahmed, uh, thank you, Mariam. Ahmed? Yeah, I, um, I agree with everything that's said. I think the roles of, um, you know, an editor and peer reviewer are, are slightly different. Um, an editor looks at scope, whether your um, manuscript fits in with the journal scope. Uh, does it fit in with the readership? Um, and then to a lesser extent, the clinical significance or the impact of, of your publication. And reviewers, um, I think as a reviewer, my first thing is always the methodology. Um, and going back to checklists, if I see they've used the checklist, um, I want to see that they've they've actually used the checklist because some manuscripts you'll see they they said oh this conformed to this checklist and then when you read through the paper 
the very first thing of some of these checklists is that in the title of the manuscript, you have to say what the type of the study is. For example, mm -hmm. systematic review meta-analysis, the um, Prisma checklist says you have to put the title, uh, the, the type of study in the title. So I know automatically when I read the methods or the abstract, it says conform to Prisma. And the very first thing is not in the title. The abstract isn't formatted correctly. Um, automatically, I get, um, you know, a reduced enthusiasm reading the paper. Uh, so methods is the number one thing that will reduce my enthusiasm for reading the paper. And then incoherent, you know, they're not getting the message across. Um, the methods do not correlate with the results. So uh, what they're... Uh, you know, the, the methodology, the different types of experiments that have been done, um, it's not flowing with the results that follow after. I do agree the introduction and, and discussion are less important. And I also look at the last paragraph of the intro because I do want to see what the hypothesis is and have they attempted to actually, um, you know, stick to that hypothesis in their research study. Perfect. Uh, thank you. So now uh, I'll move on to my last question of the day, which is actually I'm very glad uh, that we have different backgrounds here uh, with us. I know. Uh, so my question, which I felt when I went from my dental, so I didn't do bachelor's here in Pakistan. We do something very similar to what we do in Europe, that once you graduate from your high school or A-levels or FSC, you go into medical school, you do the medical school, and then in, either in the medical school itself, or as soon as you go into postgraduate uh, training, you are expected to do some sort of research. However, there is no formal training in methodology or writing skills. I know Dr. Samir, uh, has been involved in curriculum writing for our dental schools in Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Samir, what's your take on this? Do you think, first of all, it's relevant or not? Which I think you, I know what you're going to say. I think I'm but biased, but I'm biased. And so I think it's relevant, but there's a lot of opposition to this. Um, and sometimes I've been tasked with getting final year students or house offices to do research. And a lot of them who want to pursue clinical careers, they don't see any value in this at all. So it's very difficult to get them to sort of do research. I'm, I'm a firm believer that, you know, you need to have some basics. And uh, I have struggled for, for a couple of decades because, you know, I didn't have those basics. So I had to learn the hard way. So I don't want others to go through with this. But uh, I know that... Um, young people in Pakistan, or at least young dentists in Pakistan, about 80% of them don't want to do anything with research. So it'll, there'll be opposition to this. It's already, to an extent, part of the curriculum in community dentistry. Uh, you know, they're supposed to learn. This usually happens in second year uh, of dental training in Pakistan. Uh, and there are some institutions that try and continue this and try and get them to do some research by the time they've graduated. So there is there are some efforts being made and it is to an extent part of the curriculum is just that we don't really implement it too well. Uh, I'm gonna come back to you, Dr. Samir, uh, but before that, I'm gonna ask uh, Mariam um, and Ahmed, uh, what's your take on this? Even though our audience 100% agrees that this should be part of the curriculum, but that could be because we are in a symposium and everyone who's attending the session is sort of you know biased. I'm glad yes. actually someone didn't say no. By <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> I think it should be a part of um, uh, the curriculum. Whether or not that person is going to become a researcher is irrelevant because your education at dental school or medical school, or wherever that you are educated, finishes and then you are out in the world on your own making decisions, not for yourself only, but for your patients as well. So let's say a new surgical procedure is introduced and a new, um, I don't know, dental material, or whatever that is introduced into your practice, a new sutures is introduced into your practice. You need to be able to do research in order to know this is the best thing to do for your patient. 
You might not ever publish that, but you should be able to identify where the research um, should be done. You should be able to look at the data and think to yourself, okay, this is good data, I can trust it, and I will use this methodology for my patients, or look at it and say, no, I still need more information about this thing, I am going to wait and see what people that are going to do research on it are going to do. If you wanna do research as a career, obviously it makes sense, but even as a clinician, even as a pure clinician, you need to be able to do some research. And the same is true about writing skills. Your writing skills are not going to be only for publishing papers. You might find, um, um, my favorite story is the um, osteonecrosis of the jaw, uh, medication induced, that was not done as a research. It was first introduced as a bunch of case series. So if those clinicians, didn't know how to write and communicate their findings, we would still probably be confused about what is happening because large data, large clinical trials takes time. And through a lot of case series that are coming from clinicians, research is actually changing. So the writing skills and research methodology is required if we want to have a comprehensive clinician. But the emphasis on it may be different from a person that is going to do a master's degree for, or a person that is going to be going to private practice or working in a hospital. Uh, and I 100% I agree with that, Miriam. Thank you so much for pointing these points out. Uh, Emmett, do you want to add anything to this? I think one of the obstacles um, or the struggles that Dr. Samir alluded to is, is the um, opposition towards the formal inclusion of this in, in dental or medical curriculum. Um, one motivation should be uh, you will get patients in your career that will come to you with a manuscript, with a, a journal article or publication. And if you don't have that level of formal training and knowledge, you won't be able to adequately assess the paper. And sometimes these are very serious conditions that gravely affect the patient's quality of life. And there's a new experimental therapy or a really old therapy that's being used and um, or an off-label use of that medication. And so if you're able to adequately assess the rigor of and the, of the research, um, you can serve your patients better. I actually see this issue uh, not just in undergrad medical curriculum, but in postgrad medical curriculum. Um, it's very scarce that you find a even a postgraduate program that has a dedicated um, manuscript writing uh, formal training. What you do have is mentors and researchers and clinicians that will indirectly supervise uh, the writing skills and methodology, but very few programs have dedicated um, research methodology and writing skills. And also, you'll notice you have some excellent research that gets published, but researchers uh, don't have the necessary skills to deliver that in a presentation format. So you'll see um, high-end researchers that um, don't have lecturing skills that are of adequate standards. So it's not just uh, methodology and writing skills that I think should be introduced. It's also pre presentation and engagement skills uh, that need to be happened both at an undergraduate and a postgraduate level. And there are warning signs of this. If you have new researchers or students that don't have the formal training, you'll see signs of this in the drafts of the manuscripts they sent you. So uh, they don't cite certain pieces of text. You'll see direct copy and paste plagiarism. You'll see that happening, but they don't know better because they hadn't had the formal training. So um, that's something I've noticed uh, uh, quite a bit. And I think there needs to be emphasis on it. There is opposition, but we should highlight the motivation should be uh, to assess these articles in patient care. And this happens every day, so. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, Dr. Samir? Um, so from this discussion, it appears that there need to be two streams or two options available to undergrad students. One is uh, for 
you know, uh, critically appreciating or analyzing uh, or reading the articles and research. And then the other should be for those who are actually interested in, in more of the methodology and stuff. So, so yeah, and, and that's very interesting because uh, I, which I don't think I ever shared that with any of you, uh, even though I know all three of you for a while now. So the first time when I was doing my master's degree, we had to do this course on research writing. Um, and you know, the first class that we attended, I know I was like, why are they even teaching us this? Uh, obviously I was uh, very incompetent and uh, uneducated at that time, which I'm still am, I, I don't know. Uh, but at that time, I remember this quote that our professor came in, Dr. Williard McCall, uh, he came in and he said that whatever you read in black and white is not true. And I was surprised and shocked, semi-shocked at the end of the day, because for me, I thought that at the end of the day, when a paper gets published, that is the most scientific evidence that is available, uh, which I now we even actually, I think the situation has gotten even worse now with these predatory journals that Ahmed was alluding to earlier in our talk today. Uh, so I, I do feel that it does teach you about critical thinking at the end of the day, which as a clinician you need, which what Mariam was talking about as well. So let's, uh, that's the end of the poll questions. And now I'm going to go to the audience. So I'm very happy that we have a few questions for you guys. So I am going to ask these questions from our audience now, or from the audience to, the, to our panelists. So the first question is, uh, do we have any digital resource online where one can put keywords of research title and it can return possible match journals for publishing? Uh, Emmet or Mariam or Dr. Samir, whoever wants to go first. Or I can go first, or whatever you guys if you, Google, <laughs> if you Google this, there are actually lists of electronic websites that help you to do this. But um, I, because I haven't really used them, so I can't say. Uh, so, uh, Ahmed or Mariam, you guys want to answer this? So there, there are tools out there. Um, I know a colleague of mine uh, used a tool and has been using this internet tool. Uh, that's been very helpful where you put in keywords and then you get a list of journals with their impact factors. I'm trying to find the name of that tool. So you have uh, to it's bear web of science. It's uh, web of science. Uh, Clarivate has this. It's called web of science. So you just write down the name of your uh, title of your paper and you write down the abstract in a section and it actually cross matches it uh, using the keywords. Uh, in your abstract and your title with the keywords that are used to describe the aims and scope of a journal. And that's somewhat relevant. It gives you a good idea, but I would strongly encourage you to use the methodology that Dr. Samir was talking about earlier. Uh, the papers that you have cited in your paper uh, actually is the best way or resource that you have because those, have been, those journals have already been publishing very similar kind of research. And then there's always this element of, you know, editors being slightly more biased when they read uh, their own papers that have been cited within a manuscript. Uh, Mariam, do you want to add anything to this? Um, no, I was just going to do the same, uh, to say the same thing that you, I think you can do that on Scopus and Web of Science. Um, and it basically tells you um, where you can match it, but at the end of the day, what I've always done is to look at what I have cited and go back to the same people, basically. Uh, yeah, and so uh, the I just got the name of the, the one that had been recommended to me by a colleague. It's called uh, Jane, J-A-N-E, biosemantics.org. And what it does is you type in your keywords or your abstract, and then it highlights uh, a list of journals that gives the confidence level, the article influence, and it shows articles. Now, I don't use this tool just because I agree. I think, um, you know, the senior author on the paper would probably direct you best uh, or yourself looking at what citations, what references you've used, um, 
there is usually for your area of research, you will know what the uh, go-to journals are, the reputable journals are. Uh, and I'd only ever use that tool if I've exhausted the reputable options um, to look at other venues that I was not very familiar with, so. Uh, thank you. So the next question is that PubMed and Google Scholar, uh, mostly we use it in Pakistan. Is it a reliable tool in terms of impact factor and et cetera? Panelists, what do you guys think? It is a reliable tool in terms of the impact factor. Um, I think, I think um, uh, PubMed doesn't exclude the self-citation. And sometimes when you are applying for jobs, they take the self-citation out of your H-index. And, um, and because, because if you've published in the same field over and over and over again, you've cited yourself over and over and over again, and you inflate your H-index um, to a certain level, if your career is past a certain point, you can't inflate it more than a particular amount. But um, it is a good place to start. And I think um, I'm, I'm going to go on a detour and say, maybe impact factor of a journal is not as important as, um, as other things such as who's going to read this. You, you, you may have a paper that has been cited a hundred times in a journal with an impact factor of two. Um, so don't, don't focus on the impact factor for, for too long and too much because the predatory journals have inflated impact factors that may change in the future as well. So if you are publishing in a particular field, look at the most reputable journals in that field and just try and shoot for the stars that you're gonna end up on the moon or somewhere um, and don't focus too much on the impact factor. So I'm so happy that you mentioned this I will, because that was my next question. What's our obsession with impact factor and is it just, you just, gave us an other uh, aspect of it. But why are we so obsessed about it? Uh, is it because of the way our system is designed or do you feel that there is some justification behind it? Ahmed, Dr. Samir. So um, I think as, uh, you know, as human beings, we want an oversimplistic uh, metric for us to, um, you know, view where is the best uh, journal. Um, so we want something that oversimplifies it. And the, and the problem with impact factors is it's a number. And so we do oversimplify uh, it. And there's a lot of, um, you know, hidden metrics that go into it. Uh, and I think what is the most important is the, uh, the which journal will get the most readership for your article. Uh, so if you see a higher impact factor journal, that necessarily doesn't mean your particular article uh, will be read by the most people. And again, impact factors change over time. So if you submit to a one impact for Jack factor journal today, which you feel um, has done an excellent job with the peer review, the, the papers that are coming out are really strong. They're relevant to your field. Usually these um, journals in a couple of years, their impact factors just keep growing and growing. So you shouldn't be dissuaded from submitting to a journal with a low impact factor today, because it's likely if they're doing a good job with their peer reviews and their citations, their impact factors are gonna increase and vice versa. These inflated journals with high processing publication fees that have high impact factors, uh, after several years, when they get analyzed and reanalyzed, you'll notice their impact factors start to go down. Uh, so impact factors should not be uh, something to entice you completely. Uh, and then my final point is about submitting to a journal that has a higher impact factor. If you find that your manuscript is, you put a lot of time and effort and you wanted to, you've selected four different journals uh, in that area of your field, you've, they've been previously cited in your research. What I would suggest is 
don't be scared to submit to the highest impact of them for, because what tends to happen is even if you get a rejection, the reviewer comments that you get are going to be very helpful for you to strengthen your paper for the next submission. Um, so a lot of people get disheartened when they get a rejection. But if you get a rejection with reviewer comments, and usually if it's a higher impact journal, these are experts in the field, uh, that rejection could possibly be a very valuable thing and a, a victory. That's how I see it sometimes. Uh, because you have this invaluable comments, you strengthen your manuscript and you re resubmit to somewhere else. Dr. Samir, I saw you smiling. So, well, so well said and some of the things exactly to say, uh, as human beings, we love to read things. So there's always going to be ratings, you know, and we need to then share this on social media and, and everything. So there are always ratings. And sometimes, you know, those ratings don't really convey the real value of something. So it's, it's just one of those things. And um, it's it, it was a real fad 20 years ago when, when this started off, you know, with the impact factors. And now, fortunately, a lot of people, you know, are slightly skeptical, which is great. So for someone uh, who is a postgraduate, uh, and that's what a question, uh, the, we have a question about this as well, who is a postgraduate, is about to complete his PhD or her PhD thesis, uh, and now they want to decide a paper should, or for uh, a journal for publishing a manuscript. Do, what do you would suggest them to do? Like, would you suggest them to look for the highest impact factor or... Uh, which I think we already discussed this, but let's just summarize our findings into one big answer. So Mariam, I'll ask you this. Uh, so someone who has just completed the PhD, uh, they have their thesis ready. Now they want to condense it into a paper. Uh, where should they publish? Should um, they look into impact factor or not? I, there's, there's, a, there's a tricky thing there. And that is, um, let's just go with the simple things. You've done a PhD in this field, you know the journals in and out. You should know what the best journal in your field is. You should go for it. The tricky thing is sometimes those very good journals have a very long processing period. So you have to be waiting for nine months to get that rejection letter. So there is a fine balance between Am I gonna go and risk it? So some journals, are, I know people that submit to um, New England Journal of Medicine and journals such as Blood, and they are happy if they get that rejection within 48 hours, because they normally get rejected within the first 12 hours. So if it takes 48 hours, they think, oh, the editor has read my paper. This is excellent. But there are paid journals such as um, JDR, Journal of Dental Research, that was for a long time the highest uh, impact factor in dentistry. It would take them three to six months to reject your paper. So are you going to, if you are that confident, to, if you believe in yourself that much, that you are going to get somewhere with this and you, it, that comments are worth it, just go for the highest possible. And if I may recommend something, I will give you one piece of advice that my co-supervisor gave me. And that is, when you write your articles, write concisely, right? If you can write it in 50 words and you can write it in 300 words, write it in 50 words. But when your uh, editor gets back to you with questions for a minor review or a major review, get back to them with a very long rebuttal. So keep your words for your rebuttal and write concise papers because editors are humans and they are going to get bored and they're going to reject you out of boredom and they're going to accept you out of boredom. So write short papers and long rebuttals and go for the highest impact factor that you dare to go. Excellent advice. Uh, and, you know, I'll add on to that. So it's easier said than done writing a shorter version of something that you really like. Uh, there is a story that Mark Twain once wrote a letter to his student's teacher. Uh, he was in a hurry, so he ended up writing a five-page letter. And in the end, he apologized and he said, I'm so sorry I was in a hurry. That's why I ended up writing five pages. Because even he knew 
that if you want to concise something, you need to really condense it down into as small, you know, limited number of words as possible. So I'll move on to the next question. Uh, oh, actually, so, it's, it's, uh, so the so I think that's it. We, uh, I would now take the opportunity to thank you. Um, I really enjoyed this session. I'm not sure if our audience did or not, but I had a pleasure. I always enjoy this. At the end of the day, I actually feel bad for my audience because I feel that I hijack the session and then I just take over and I ask all the questions that I want to ask and uh, uh, I feel really interested about. So uh, once again, thank you so much to each of you for taking time out. Uh, I know Ahmed made sure that I know this, that he woke up at 4.30 a.m. this morning uh, just to get ready for this. Uh, he had to put like three alarms. So I'm really grateful to you, Ahmed. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Samir and Dr. Mariam, thank you so much for taking time out today on a Saturday, uh, just so that you can be with us and uh, enlighten us with your insightful knowledge. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, take care and uh, goodbye.